for the people we know or through their network. So in that way, we really try to secure, you know, all the all the stuff which uh, that they will be uh, or will get it to the end user. Yeah, I think another issue will be like fundraising, because the diaspora organization mostly fundraise from people uh, and from private sector, and they usually tend to respond to a very uh, hectic and agile, like some the city is being bombed and then everything everyone understand that they need help. That's why they uh, donate their money. But if we or diaspora organizations say that now we're fundraising for, let's say, I don't know, demining lessons in school, like for the nexus, I wouldn't see um, so many private people being donating uh, such amount of money, and I think that's the issue of fundraising for diaspora organizations will arise. Yeah, I would add to answer to to the Chris question, like what could be done in a yeah if you go back right in a different way. Of course, um, we we are trying to get prepared to the war, uh, but you know generally I think nobody could get prepared. But if we know that it would happen, we would do hundred times more, and that's of course it's uh, yeah that's uh, where we'd spend more time on that. Also, uh, we're not in a, in a first in a first run of uh, fundraising where it went through from people. Um, it's it's uh, very very many resources needed to to show the organization. And I think in Denmark we were lucky that already people knew about us. But if you're talking about, for example, businesses, uh, there is like um, standard on the market, uh, at least in Denmark that the uh, bigger company or large companies, they donate only to uh, to the main players. And we were not one of them. Yeah, we're not talking about big part of resources, but even if they would allocate 5% to us, that would help a lot. And it didn't happen. So in this way, if uh, we knew about this issue, we would address it uh, beforehand. Thanks, Andre. Maybe we take a last quick round of questions. I think there were four People waiting five. <laughs> I'm not sure we'll be able to address all of them. I think most of them they address because I wanted to ask, you know, what challenges have you faced while you're doing this and also how do you overcome? And I think you already addressed some of them. But in terms of what was the most uh, um, communication channel you were using? Because especially, Andre, I think you said that you were connected, you know, um, Ukrainian um, diaspora um, globally, especially in Europe, you know, those in Poland and, you know, other parts of Europe. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's connection which has been uh, established during uh, during our last year communication or during the period we've been working with. Uh, that's uh, communication to other diasporas or to to network. Uh, but if you take general communication, it's it's a it's a Facebook, it's a Twitter, it's a Instagram, all the media which we could use for free. Basically, we didn't invest a, any. Uh, um, any cent into into an advertisement, so that that what was used a lot. Uh, I would tell you the story we had there. Uh, for example, for Bava Ukraine, uh, we had there uh, two Facebook groups. One was official, one was unofficial. In a, in a moment of the, when the war started, uh, official group raised uh, maybe I don't know twenty percent. Unofficial uh, rose uh, raised like I think twenty times. We got from 400 members to 30,000 followers in this group. Somehow people didn't know which to choose, and then we switched to that group. So in this way, we're trying you know, to see, OK, the people are there. Here's the targets. Uh, we're our audience who are listening to us and help us with in-kind donation or with financial donation. So that's, uh, yeah, look into the market. Can I add on to that a bit? Because it's like one of the funny things too about with even with the stuff critique, let's say the in-kind critique, is that it was so difficult in doing this assessment to determine what was a diaspora organization and what was diaspora organizing <laughs> themselves and just sending things. And that happened as well. And it, so it's very different, difficult to distinguish, including for the fundraising even Facebook allows you to raise money for organizations without their permission. So a lot of organizations were also put in that position where they were being approached by informal groups saying, oh, here, I've set up a Facebook page and I've raised, you know, like a yeah, million dollars for you without yeah. any pre, 
knowledge of that that was going exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah. Or people for their best day air donation ask to donate it to Bavai Ukraine and create fundraisers. Yeah. That's true. We're getting very close to the coffee break. Maybe I'll take uh, three last questions. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about this business of four billion dollars worth of, yeah. of resources being made available, and how 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 diasporic organisations see this massive inflow into the official sector. I remember at the beginning of this part of the crisis, UNHCR said it wouldn't really be involved, and then it suddenly saw this huge opportunity and is very involved now in fundraising. Uh, who knows exactly what they're doing on the ground? I don't know, but my my question is. How do the diaspora organizations view this enormous influx into the official sector? And then the, the, um, the other thing is, like, for instance, the, in, in the United Kingdom, you have this disaster emergency committee, which has raised enormous amounts of resources. And are those, are those available to diaspora organizations that are based in the UK, for instance? And is that the same in other countries which have these umbrella fundraising arrangements that would allow diaspora organizations to tap in? question based on ignorance. Can I answer right away? Uh, maybe we just take two, three okay. more questions and then we wrap up, if that's okay. Yes. Thank you. I've been here all day and it concerns me that we're only talking about the diaspora in Ukraine. What is the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on the diaspora organization in their home countries? I represent the Canada Ukraine Foundation. We have raised $40 million in 80 days. But 10% of that money has been allocated to resettlement of Ukrainians in Canada. We leverage that $4 million that the province of Ontario has given us $300 million for the next three years to resettle things. I haven't heard of any discussions here at all about fundraising and the impact, because this will now make us stronger. And if we're talking about longer term thing, we were dying in the diaspora. Now this is an occasion to grow and will be funded by totally different. Uh, let me give you one last example. You know CN Rail is a big railway company. They gave us $25,000 we said, that's fantastic. But then I went to work on the people who I know that were in the CN executive offices, and I explained to them what we were doing, and we got a 1.1 million dollars. And of that 1.1 million, we allocated 100,000 to Razom in the United States because CN Rail has people working in the United States. So there's a myriad of different ways that you can raise money that you don't have to worry about the four billion dollar elephants in the room. Okay, I don't want to play with those elephants. Sure. Thank you. Um, I wanted to find out, I was speaking to some young um, Ukrainian diaspora in Brussels um, who have been doing a great deal of work in advocacy um, and fundraising and some of the other areas you raised. Um, and I'm interested to understand, within the formal sector, there are structures to look after their staff and their, the things that they're dealing with and so on. But within the diaspora space, what is being done? So what next, if you like, for diaspora um, Ukrainians who are doing the response. Um, it struck me because um, she's a project manager within a, an a ING institution, but now she's looking at things like raising money for arms and it's and looking at um, exactly and um, having to think about um, her positioning and those who've been left behind and how to help and, and, and so on and so forth. So I was just interested to understand how do you look after yourselves? Um, in this whole idea of what next um, in this potentially protracted um, crisis that's, that we're in. Yeah, um, so first we start here. I think this, um, what you're saying for billion, I think for us is, I will talk only about Ukrainian diaspora in Denmark. It's a, it's a black area. We, we, we don't know about it, we don't have access, we don't have information, we don't know even how to apply. And that's, I think, where DRC will come in and support us with that one because we are, we are, we are missing their um, proficiency in order to make the correct application. And we are 
we don't know the way, right? We are, we are people not from this industry. We are people, we are volunteers, basically, who came from uh, different businesses, right? From IT, finance, etc. And then now we get into, into this industry of humanitarian work, and of course, we don't know all these rules. And where we work with Denmark and DRC on uh, bring us the knowledge how it works and to help us to create, you know, this, for example, application where we can apply for these funds. Of course, the needs is there. And uh, it's enormous. We're getting uh, like I don't know, hundred thousands requests on a on a support. And of course, first um, fundraising which we made on a private, it's already it's already gone. People had a top of their feeling. We hit the wave, and then it went down. Now it's only I think institutional money which can support us. Uh, then second answer from uh, from a uh, question from Victor. Uh, yes, I think uh, we're looking for different way because if we cannot get uh, money from our funds and institutional, or uh, not investors, but donors, uh, which is quite hard and quite complicated, then it's businesses which we need to, to reach. But as I said, businesses, big businesses in, in Denmark, they are more um, focused on uh, big NGOs or big institutional uh, players like Red Cross. Um, so it's hard to reach middle uh, businesses. Yes, they're they available, uh, but it's not like they can donate like one million. They can donate twenty thousand, uh, for example. And that's what we are what we are doing. Yeah. And the last one was uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the main uh, protection of our stuff in in Denmark. I think the main thing that we are. are uh, start losing our resources because in simply uh, our volunteers in the first uh, months of the war, they use their uh, vocation uh, for 2022 in order to help to Ukraine. So we really have a uh, withdrawal of resources all. Um, and then we are uh, looking for the core team who will coordinate people who are willing to come and donate uh, two hours here, three hours there, you know, and it's it's a big work, you know. It's not like you have a uh, full time employee and they come in every day and you can rely on them. They come and they go, and you really need to have this uh, volunteer management system. I think that's our next uh, project we are we are running with uh, Dursi uh, to improve on that. I would add a little bit on that. Uh, it also mm, like this fundraising issue. It depends on the country very much because for example in Turkey uh, they are not allowed to do anything like abroad so they, they can't help Ukraine they are prohibited to and that's the restriction of the local government uh, they only can help those refugees this, uh, that come to Turkey so it uh, very much depends on the country but also there is one issue that we haven't talked about it and I think this will be a challenge um, Institutional organizations, they have at least 30%, okay, 20 to 30% of that 4 billion elephants allocated for administration. They have staff, they have offices, they have salaries, etc. 30%. And uh, diaspora organizations allocate all of the fundraising directly to the project and to the food and NFI and everything. They don't leave any, like, penny for themselves. But that's actually a problem because they are burning out, because they lose their professions, they lose their salaries, etc. So I think that's a huge issue for diaspora organizations, but also for uh, local NGOs in Ukraine, because uh, I don't know how much you know about civil society in Ukraine. It's very active, but it's still volunteering. And that's like a huge campaign on localization because they they don't even feel that they are allowed to fundraise for administration. And I think that's the capacity that should be raised among DOs and NGOs, saying that you are actually allowed and it is okay to fundraise for your administration because otherwise you will not survive. Thanks. I think we'll close with uh, this great uh, last point uh, from Dina, if that's okay. Uh, if you have, I'm sorry because a few of you had questions you haven't been able to ask, but we're already seven minutes uh, into the coffee break. So maybe during the coffee break, the, the, the panelists can, can stand and you can ask your, your question directly. You but can take your coffee here. 
<laughs> and I'll do the, the wrap up uh, at when we come back to the plenary with the, the key uh, discussion points. So, but must, thank you so much, uh, Emily, uh, Andrea, yeah. and, and Dina. That's super thank useful. you. And thanks to your active participation and great questions.